They will be answered. <laughs> Let's pray before we answer all the questions. Father, we come before you, and uh, Lord, we are thankful. Grateful for your holiness and your goodness. Lord, grateful for the peace you bring to our lives and for the realities we have sung of today. Father, there is nothing greater, there is nothing better, there is nothing more worthy of our praise than you. Father, if we have made anything else above you, we ask for your forgiveness now. Show us and teach us and lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you, show of hands, how many of you have ever read a fairy tale? Okay. Seems like there'd be more of you. I know some of you probably don't want to admit you've read the fairy tales. How many of you, okay, let me ask this a different way. How many of you have ever read a fairy tale to your children? Okay, there's more of you now. One of the most telling features about a fairy tale is the ending, right? Most fairy tales, not all, but most fairy tales end with a phrase that goes something like this. Well, let's just say it all together. We know it. And they lived happily ever after. They lived happily ever after. So you guys have read them. <laughs> Snow White, Cinderella, Beauty and the Beast, Sleeping Beauty, Rapunzel, The Little Mermaid, and many, many more. All end with that ending or some version of it. And they lived happily ever after. It's interesting, some of those fairy tales, the original version of their endings weren't happily ever after endings. But in our modern day, we have changed most of the fairy tale endings to be happily ever after endings, because those are the endings we love. We all love a happily ever after ending. There hasn't been a lot to be happy about, as we have walked through the book of Job, as we followed Job through his journey, his journey has been filled with tragedy, trials, turmoil, trouble, tribulation. There's been this great testing of faith in Job's life. And over the last 11 weeks, over the past few months, we have been walking through that with Job, learning from Job and how we can face those same kind of trials and things in our own life. But we, we get here to the end. Today we end our series. And we, we get to the end, and there is a happily ever after here at the end of Job. This isn't a fairy tale. This is a, a real thing. But, but we read this happily ever after ending. If we wanted to just sum it up, verse 12 probably sums it up the best. In verse 12 of chapter 42, it says this, so the Lord blessed, and he's speaking of Job here, the Lord blessed the last part of Job's life more than the first, happily ever after. We don't always know if there's going to be a happily ever after ending, though, in real life, do we? Certainly Job didn't know there was going to be this happily ever after when he was walking through his painful trials and tragedies. While we were watching Job walk through those, some of you who've never read the book of Job probably didn't know if there was going to be a happily ever after ending. But the point is this, in real life, in the real world, we just don't always know how things are going to end. It's funny how you remember certain things from your life, certain parts of your childhood even, Things that happened 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago that you can still, to this very day, remember them as crisply and as clearly as the day that they happened. I have one of those memories from when I was seven years old. I was seven years old sitting on the cold tile floor of my parents' living room, the house they still live in today. And I remember hearing about a young girl who I had never met before named Jessica. Jessica was 18 months old at the time, and Jessica had been playing in her aunt's backyard, something most 18 months old probably do. She had just been going through her thing, playing and doing her thing, when she fell. Jessica fell into an eight-inch 
uncapped well in the back of her aunt's yard in Midland, Texas. This is what an eight inch uncapped well looks like. This is an eight inch stovepipe, but it gives you an idea of what she fell into. She would be stuck in that well for almost three days. For those three days, it was wall-to-wall coverage on the TV. The entire world held its breath and was praying for baby Jessica. After they found her and after some people got there and they were able to determine where she was in the well, they discovered she was approximately 22 feet down in that well. To give you an idea, not only of how big an 8-inch pipe looks like, but how far 22 feet is, if you look up to the top here in our sanctuary, to the peak of our roof, down to the floor, approximately 22 feet. They ran a microphone down, some other listening devices, they were pumping air into the hole, but they ran that microphone down there so they could hear her breathing. Initially, she was in pretty good spirits most of the time. Of course, she was crying and she was scared, but then she would be okay. They even heard her singing songs from Winnie the Pooh. We heard those on the TV. I can still remember it. Everything stopped for Jessica in Midland, Texas. She had a great advantage. This happened in Midland, Texas. Everybody in Midland, Texas dropped everything they were doing and came to try to help this little girl. A plan was devised. They decided they were going to drill up a larger shaft far enough away from the original pipe that was big enough for a man to go down, and then they were going to drill a shaft over to her horizontally to try to get her out. All the engineers, all the drillers, all the fitters, all the welders, anybody that had anything, they put it all on the line for Jessica. Even people who didn't like working together came together to work for Jessica. 55 hours pass. They drilled that hole, and they drilled the hole horizontally over to her, and they attempted the rescue. They faced a bunch of different problems along the way, but when they got down there to her and they were actually, for the first time, able to really see the predicament that she was in, they discovered that the way she was stuck in the pipe was going to make this rescue even harder than they thought. You see, when Jessica, this is not a real baby, by the way, just want to let y'all know, it's not a real baby, but when Jessica was, was playing on the pipe... And by the way, an 18-month-old would be bigger than this, too. When she was playing on the pipe, she didn't just fall down into the well. That would have been bad enough, right? Boop, that would have been horrible. But instead, when she was playing, somehow, she fell into the well, and one of her legs came up above her head, and she had fallen in in a split position. And she was lodged in the well for, at this point, 55 hours with one leg above her head. They could hear through the microphone that Jessica wasn't doing good at this point. One doctor is quoted as saying this, by this time she was starting to enter that ominous place where life transitions into death. Time was running out, and time was almost up for Jessica. A paramedic named Robert O'Donnell was selected to inch his way into that larger shaft and to go across the horizontal shaft to try to rescue her. He had tried earlier in the day but wasn't able to to get her, they had decided to widen the shaft, the horizontal shaft, a little bit more to make it a little bit easier for him and hopefully to be able to get her out. They made the decision to send Robert back down again because time was growing short and Jessica didn't have much longer. They told Robert before he went down that this was probably going to be his last opportunity to save Jessica's life. Robert went down and he tried and he tried and he tried. But he couldn't unlodge her from the shaft 
with her leg bent up above her head the way it was. At one point, Robert sent word back up the hole, and he said, I don't think I can do it. We might have to find another way. The reply came back with a great sense of urgency, and it came back very quickly. And the reply was this, and I quote, Robert, you have to do it, and you have to do it now. Jessica is almost out of time. Pull hard. Pull as hard as you have to pull. I say again, pull hard. There was a pause, and then he heard these words in the darkness of that tunnel. You might have to break her in order to save her. Mm. You might have to break her in order to save her. He took a deep breath and went back to work, and he did what he had to do. Shortly after, little Jessica came up from that shaft, and she was rushed off to the hospital where she would stay for over a month and underwent multiple surgeries to save her leg. They were able to save it. All she lost was a pinky toe, praise God. Her face was badly damaged and some other parts of her body, but they were able to put it all back together. The picture that they show there on the screen is not actually Robert. That's somebody else carrying her. Robert was still in the hole at that time. A picture of Jessica with her parents where you can see some of the mess that was on her face. Jessica's now in her late 30s. She still lives in Midland, Texas, not far from where she fell into that hole, that shaft. She's now the mother of two kids. She's a special education teacher, works with special ed students. And you know, the funny thing is, she has absolutely no memory of the events of those almost 60 hours in that well. She doesn't remember any of it. But many of us remember almost all of it, don't we? She got a happily ever after. Her family got a happily ever after. But during those moments, during those days, during those 60 hours, they didn't know if there was going to be a happily ever after. You know, I was thinking about the ending here in the book of Job, and it hit me. Man, it hit me so hard. Sometimes God has to pull hard, doesn't he? Sometimes he has to pull hard enough to break us in order to save us. A couple of points to ponder you may want to think on this week. We don't have really time to get into them, but I think they're important. Points to ponder, uh, three of them. The first one would be this. Though the ending here in Job is happy, we can't forget that the suffering was real. Sometimes when we read the happy ending, we forget about the suffering that came before it. The suffering was real. And so is the happy ending. Point to ponder number two is this. God used Job's suffering to humiliate the devil, not to elevate Job. Job's not the hero in this text. God is. God used his suffering and his story, not to make Job a biblical hero, but he used his suffering and his story to humiliate the devil and to show us how powerful and how good and how gracious God is. Ponder that. And the third thing I would encourage you to ponder this week would be this. God has used Job's suffering to encourage and equip millions of people over the millennial. I wonder how many people have gotten to heaven and walked up to Job and said, you know what, your story got me through a really bad time in my life. Your story really helped me hold on. And I don't know if that makes it any easier or any better for Job, but I would bet a lot of those conversations have happened So even in the midst of our suffering, maybe we can remember God has a plan even for our suffering. Ponder it. The big idea for today is this. Our desire as God's people, our desire as believers, should be for holiness, not happiness. We're on a pursuit of holiness, church, not happiness. Amen? Today I want to encourage you one last time as we close this series out. This is our last sermon in this series from Job. I want to encourage you one last time to live the unwaveringly faithful life. Be the kind of 
disciple that Job was. Live a life that is faithful to your Father in heaven, no matter what circumstance or situation you face. But you have to remember, if you're going to do that, you have to remember the goal is holiness, not happiness. I want you to see three specific things from this fairy tale ending in the book of Job. The first can be described with one word. The word is restoration. There's a great restoration at the end of the story here in this fairy tale ending. We see it in verse 10 and beyond, but we'll just read verse 10. It says, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and doubled his previous possessions. God restored everything to Job. I want you to notice something here, something that would be easy for us to miss, something that would be easy for us to skip over as we read through this happy fairy tale ending. I want you to notice that Job prayed for his friends, not himself. Job didn't pray for the restoration of his family. Job didn't pray for the restoration of his flocks and his herds. Job did not pray for the restoration of his wealth. Job didn't pray for the restoration of his reputation or his legacy. Job prayed for what the Lord directed him to pray for, and that was for other people, for his friends. And he did that from a place of brokenness. He did it before anything was restored in his life. Job is, is utterly broken here when he is praying for his friends. He did it from a place of holiness, not a place of happiness. Job's not the only person in the Bible that God restores. If we had time, we could talk about people like Joseph and Naomi and Ruth and Jonah. Last week, we talked about Manasseh. We could talk about David. We could talk about Peter. We could talk about Moses and Jacob. We could talk about Sarah. The list goes on and on and on. There are so many people that we see a great restoration happen in their life. The point is this, though. God is able to restore things that seem broken things that seem shattered, things that, that seem like there's no possible way this can ever be fixed, God can do it. I bet Job never in his wildest dreams as he was going through all that trial and all that tragedy and all that pain, I bet Job never in his wildest dreams thought that he would experience a restoration like he got. But through his unwavering pursuit of holiness, not happiness, and in God's sovereignty, God chooses to restore everything that Job lost, and not just to restore it, but to double it. You might be saying, well, yeah, well, that, I mean, that's all good and well with camels and donkeys and herds and money, but you can't replace a child. Job lost 10 of his children in the early parts of this book. You can't replace those kids. I would agree with you on that. You can't replace a child. I've wrestled with that. When you've been in ministry as long as I have, unfortunately, you come to understand that the pain and the sorrow and the tragedy and the grief of life is something nobody's exempt from. You also come to understand that the pain and the sorrow and the grief of losing a child is one of the deepest and most debilitating things you can ever experience in your life. I've walked with some of you through that journey. I've never had to go on that journey myself. I've never experienced it. I pray I never do. I won't pretend to understand it, but there are some in this room, some sitting around you, maybe it's you, who have experienced it, and unfortunately you know exactly what it's like. And it doesn't matter if you lose a child when they're babies or teenagers or when they're grown and gone from your house and have been for a long time. There is no pain like losing a child. But here's what we have to understand as we examine this in Job's life and as we consider it for our own world and our own life. When the Lord restored Job's family, he wasn't replacing his kids he restored his family. It says in verse 13, he also had seven sons and three daughters. He replaced the 10 children that were lost. It's not a child for child replacement. It's God restoring the family that Job had lost. He's not replacing those 10 children he lost in chapter one, but he's once again doubling Job's blessing as a father. 
You see, when Job got to heaven, he was greeted by his first 10 kids. And sometime after Job got to heaven, he got to greet his second 10 kids. It reminds me of the way David approached the loss of his own child in 2 Samuel, starting in verse 12. This is the child he had with Bathsheba. It says this in 2 Samuel 12, well, I'll start in verse 21. It says, his servants asked him, why have you done this? While the baby was alive, you fasted and wept, but when he died, you got up and ate food. He answered, while the baby was alive, I fasted and wept because I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let him live. There may be a fairy tale ending here. But look at verse 23. But now that he's dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? And then listen to these last words he says. He says, I'll go to him, but he will never return to me. David wasn't saying this doesn't bother me or this isn't painful. He wasn't saying this isn't a problem or something he's questioning in his life. He's just saying, I've come to the realization that I'm going to get to see him again, but I'm going to have to go to him to see him again. I think Job understood that as well. I think Job understood that his 10 children were not gone forever, that one day he would go to them. And he also knew that later, sometime in the future, the other 10 would then come to him. You see, as believers, we don't look at death the same way the world does. We're reminded over and over again through Scripture in places like 1 Thessalonians 4.13, when Paul says, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. He doesn't say don't grieve. He says we don't grieve like the rest who have no hope because we grieve and we mourn out of our great sense of hope in the gospel, out of our great sense of hope in Christ, knowing that we will one day go to them and that the kids we leave behind when we go will one day come to us if they are believers. You see, the Lord fully restored Job in every possible way. But it's important, and we have to understand this, and I'm going to emphasize this today. We have to understand that God is not paying Job back for his suffering. Job is, uh, God is not paying Job back or giving him reparations, if you will, for his suffering. This isn't God saying, hey man, you've been a good soldier and you really fought the good fight, so guess what? I'm going to, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to double everything. That's not what God's doing. The Bible doesn't say anything like that. He doesn't owe Job anything. Job even says that. This lavish restoration that God brings into Job's life, including restoring his entire family, is not based on Job's righteousness. It's based on God's love and God's grace and God's sovereignty and nothing else. Nothing more, nothing less. This restoration was a reward or a payment not for anything Job had done. It was just God's gift based on God's sovereign grace. James points this out in the New Testament, the only verse in the New Testament that talks about Job. Here's what it says, James 5, 10, and 11. Brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as examples of suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome that the Lord brought about. He says God did it. Job didn't do it. Had nothing to do with Job. And then it says this, the Lord is compassionate and merciful. God brought it about through his compassion and his mercy for Job. When we look at the unwavering life of Job, we're reminded that our desire should be for holiness, not happiness. Because when we seek happiness, there may not always be a restoration. But when we seek holiness, there always will be a restoration. We see so much more than just a restoration here, though. Let me jump to point number two. We also see great rejoicing. The book of Job is not known as a happy book. When you wake up in the morning and go, you know what, I think I want to read something real encouraging from the Bible, you don't automatically go, I think I'll read the book of Job today. You, you go to Job when you're down in the dumps, all right? You go to Job when you want to see somebody who had it worse than you. But, but this isn't a happy book. This isn't a pick-me-up kind of a scripture, right, or a book. 
There's been very little rejoicing for Job, for his wife, for his friends. This has been a season marked by extreme sadness and deep physical, emotional, and spiritual pain for everybody involved. The likes of which any sane person would have to admit would be almost impossible for anyone to bear. But here, at the very end, as part of this great restoration, we see rejoicing. Look at it here, in, starting in verse 11. It says, All his brothers, sisters, and former acquaintances came to him and dined with him in his house. They sympathized with him and comforted him concerning all the adversity the Lord had brought on him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold earring. Now, we don't know how many people this is. It's a large number of people. We're not told how many brothers and sisters he had or how many former acquaintances are there, but we know it's a lot. We've heard from a few of Job's friends, and in places like Job 29, that Job was a highly respected person, that he was a person that many people sought counsel from, that he was a person many people respected, he was a person many people listened to, he was a person that many people know and were acquainted with before he lost everything. So there's no telling how many people are coming now to sit at his table and to rejoice with him. As God starts to bless Job again, everyone all of a sudden wants to be friends again with Job. Funny how that works, isn't it? When things are going bad, when your whole world's falling apart, nobody knows you. But boy, when God's blessing and God's hand is on you, everybody wants a little piece of it. If you've ever read the book of Job, you might remember what he said in places like Job 19. And, and, and I want to read this to you starting in verse 13, because I want you to remember where Job was before. Basically here in, in, in Job 19, Job feels entirely alone because he feels like everybody has abandoned him. And I want you to see who he mentions are the people who have abandoned him. He says in verse 13, he has removed my brothers from me. My acquaintances have abandoned me. My relatives stopped coming by and my close friends have forgotten me. My house guests and female servants regard me as a stranger. I am a foreigner in their sight. I call for my servant, but he does not answer. Even if I beg him with my own mouth, my breath is offensive to my wife. That, that could be another issue, but <laughs> his wife doesn't even want anything to do with him. And then he says, and my own family finds me repulsive. Even young boys scorn me. When I stand up, they mock me. All of my best friends despise me, and those I love have turned against me. My skin and my flesh cling to my bones. I have escaped with only the skin of my teeth. Have mercy on me, my friends. Have mercy. For God's hand has struck me. Why do you persecute me as God does? Will you never get enough of my flesh? But here at the end, when the fairy tale kicks off, there's rejoicing. And everybody, once again, is at his table wanting a little piece of it. His house is full and they're celebrating and the restoration is starting to take place and people want a part of it. And I want you to notice Job lets them have a part of it. Job hasn't forgotten what we just read. But Job is not on a quest of happiness. This isn't about proving he was right or making him happy. It's a quest of holiness. And he wants others to be close to God and see God's blessing and God's grace too. You know, Paul tells us that we can actually, even in the middle of our suffering, find reasons to rejoice. It says in Romans 5, 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Psalm 32, 10 and 11 says, Many pains come to the wicked, but the one who trusts in the Lord will have faithful love surrounding him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. 
That's the posture and the position of one who's on a quest for holiness, not happiness. It's one where we say, I'm going to rejoice because this is the day the Lord gave me. Church, as we consider all that we've learned of the life of Job in this series, we can't deny this one truth about Job. Job was never on a journey of happiness. His goal was never to be happy or to find happiness. His life, his entire story shows us his life was a quest of remaining faithful to the Lord, unwaveringly faithful to God, no matter what, and staying pure in his quest for holiness. And that should be our desire as well. Because when holiness is our only aim, restoration and rejoicing are assured. But if happiness is what we're shooting for, we're probably going to miss the mark. Here's the third one, the last one. We need to look at the reward that's here. Before we read verses 12 through 17 together and look at this reward that Job got, I, I want to once again remind you here, because I want to be careful This isn't a verse or a passage as some like to use it for prosperity teaching or prosperity gospel. That God's just going to reward you and double stuff. And if you go through a hard season, there's automatically going to be another good season on the other side of it. That's not what this is teaching. God was not paying Job back for his suffering. He didn't owe Job anything. This lavish restoration, this doubling of everything he had is not based on Job's righteousness. It's just God's love and God's grace and God's sovereignty and God choosing to do it. Nothing more, nothing less. The restoration was never a reward or a payment for anything he had been through. It was just God's gift to Job. I really think that that's an important point because so many times we we look at what God gives us and we equate that to how much God loves us. If God gives me a lot, then God must love me a lot. And if God won't give me what I want, then does he even really love me? Church, that's not the way God works. That's not the way it happens. That's not even what's happening here in Job's life. God's not saying, I love Job more. That's why I'm giving him more. He's not saying, I love Job more than everybody else in the world. That's why he's getting all of this back. Just in God's sovereignty and God's goodness and God's grace, he decided to do it. He didn't have to, but he did. See, we we have to remember, we can never judge God's love for us by what we get. Church, can I just remind you, God has already given you his son. He doesn't owe you anything else. You're not owed anything from God, period. He has given his son to die on the cross for your sins. If he never gives you anything else, be happy with what you got. With that in mind, let's look at the reward. Look at 42, 12 through 17. So the Lord blessed the last part of Job's life more than the first. He owned 14,000 sheep and goats, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named his first daughter Jemima, his second Keziah, and his third Kareen Hapak. No woman as beautiful as Job's daughters could be found in all the land, and their father granted them an inheritance with their brothers. Job lived 140 years after this and saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. Then Job died old and full of days. Several interesting things there in that reward. First, let's talk about the names of his daughters. All of those names mean specific things that point to beauty. We don't have time to go through it all today, but that's kind of interesting. It's also interesting, though, that that his daughters are named and his sons aren't. If you're a student of Scripture, if you read the Bible, you know normally it's the other way around. The, The men are named and the women aren't. But here in the book of Job, one of the oldest books of the Bible, Job's daughters are named here at the end, and his sons are not. It's just very out of the ordinary. The other interesting thing about that is it makes it a point, the Spirit makes it a point here in the Scripture 
to tell us that Job granted his daughters an equal inheritance with their brothers. Something else that would have been extremely out of the ordinary for that culture and that time. It would have been very, very weird for him to do that, but he did. That being said, the bottom line over it all from the beginning of Job to the end of Job is that he never wavered. He remained faithful to God to the very end and that God never wavered in his faithfulness to Job either. I think that's what we really have to see because there are these questions that arise throughout the book of Job, like why is God doing this? Why is God allowing this? Why would God let that happen? And here at the end, we see that God has not abandoned Job and God was never leaving Job. God was never being unfaithful to Job. He just chose to use Job to whip the devil's tail. You see, the unwavering life is not one that's defined by happiness. It's defined by our pursuit of holiness. And Job was a man that God knew he could count on to go down into that hole and do whatever he had to do. And that's a life that gets rewarded. If you're a disciple, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you call Jesus your Lord, your Savior, your Master, you need to remember what that means. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul tells us how servants work for their masters. He said this, it's a good reminder for us if we call Jesus Lord, It says, starting in verse 23, whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. Our reward is not happiness. Our reward is that God sent his son Jesus to make us holy. Your reward may not be happiness. But if you call him Lord, if you know him as master, if you repent of your sins, you will be restored to a relationship of holiness. And when you get into glory, you'll have all the happiness you're going to be able to stand. At the beginning today, I told you about Jessica, baby Jessica's story. I don't know that I have a single other story from my seventh year on this planet. But I remember that one. You know what? I was thinking about it. Her story is such a powerful reminder for us. And it's a powerful reminder and illustration for those of you who don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior as well. If you've never repented of your sins, if you don't know what would happen to you today if you passed away, if you died, I want to share this last little thing with you. Jessica was stuck in that eight-inch pipe. She couldn't get out. There was no possible way she was going to get out on her own. We're all stuck too. It's not that much different than the way she was stuck. We're stuck in a very uncomfortable position. Time is running out. The days are growing short. And without a rescue mission, you're not getting out of that pipe. We're stuck in our sin. And we can't get out of it by ourselves. Psalm 40 verses 1 through 2 says, I waited patiently for the Lord and he turned to me and he heard my cry for help. Just like people heard little Jessica crying for help out of that pipe. Verse 2 says, he brought me up from the desolate pit. Out of the muddy clay, he set my feet on a rock, making my steps secure. The Lord sent Jesus on a rescue mission down into that slimy, desolate pit of sin to save you and to save me. And he sent him just at the right time. Romans 5, 6 says, for while we were still helpless or while we were still sinners, at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. I often think about Christ there in the garden of Gethsemane, sweating drops of blood in his agony, praying, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. It's as if Jesus was yelling back up the pipe, back up the hole. Lord, I don't know if I can do this. We might need to find another way. And then down from heaven comes the reply. 
Jesus, you have to do it. You're the only one who can do it. And you have to do it now. And then God says, I'm going to have to pull really, really hard. In fact, I'm going to have to crush you to save them. In Isaiah 53, 5, it says, But he, Jesus, was pierced because of our rebellion. He was crushed by the Father for our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. Jesus didn't come from heaven to earth to find happiness. He left heaven and came to earth so he could live a perfect and holy life so you could be saved by his blood and restored to a right relationship with God so you could get out of that pipe. God sent his son and then crushed him for you. He pulled so hard that he tore him apart on the cross to the point Jesus said, Lord, why have you abandoned me? There is no other name under heaven by which you can be saved. There is no other way you're getting out of that sin predicament you're in. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. Nobody gets out of the pipe without me. If you have never called on him, if you have never repented, if you have never confessed, we encourage you to do it today, not by raising a hand, walking an aisle, standing up. We just encourage you to do business with God. He sent Jesus on a rescue mission to get you. Let's pray. If that's you, you've never repented, you've never given your life to the Lord, I encourage you to do that right now, this very hour. Wherever you are, if you can hear my voice, just say these words, pray this prayer. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. Bound up and stuck in a place I can't get out of. I know and understand you are the only way. So by faith this hour, I repent of my sins. Lord, by faith... I ask that you would save me and change me and make me new. Lord, I thank you for your grace and for your goodness. I thank you for your love and for your mercy. Lord, I thank you for your hope. And for being willing to go down into that pit for me. Father, as we close this hour, we are so grateful, so thankful, and so amazed by who you are and what you've done for us. Father, help us to spread that good news, to share it with our lips, but more importantly, to live it out and share it with our lives. Father, thank you. Thank you for pulling hard enough to get it done. We ask and we pray a blessing now on these who have gathered to worship you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for being a part of our online family and joining us for this message that God put on my heart. I pray that it blesses you. I want to ask you if you could just do three quick, simple, easy, free things for me right away. If you haven't already, number one, hit the subscribe button. Number two, hit the thumbs up or like button if you feel like this video, this sermon is worthy of that. And number three, if God blesses your heart with this message, leave an encouraging word. Just leave an encouraging comment or a thought down there in the comment section. We would appreciate that so much. Thank you for being a part of our family, for joining us uh, here for this message.